Tears of the Crown, the royal fashion highlights, and did more seating plan skullduggery scupper Prince Harry. Hello and welcome to Palace Confidential. I'm Jo Elvin and yes, I know what you're thinking. We need to change that opening graphic and we are working on it, especially as we now have a new balcony shot. That's right, we celebrated the first coronation the country has seen in 70 years and here to discuss an extraordinary day is the Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English, and the paper's diary editor, Richard Eden. Welcome to you both. Now, if you're new to us, remember to like and subscribe so you get more excellent royal content every week. Rebecca, I'm coming to you first because look at you, resplendent in your <laughs> fascinator. You were there inside Westminster Abbey. You have to tell us what, what was the atmosphere like? It, it was glorious. It was really special. I have been to a lot of events at the Abbey before, but there was something utterly magical about this. I mean, when you arrived, it felt a bit like a kind of country wedding. And, you know, lots it didn't of... look like that on the telly. It looked <laughs> like the poshest thing I've ever seen. Well, no, but that was before the kind of cameras switched on and there's all the people finding their seats. You know, Katy Perry's wandering around, <laughs> going like that, not knowing where she's sitting. Did you and, help her? Uh, no, I was, I was definitely in a different place from her. <laughs> but, you know, there were people kind of waving each other, you know, lots of kind of old royal staff that hadn't seen each other for a while. And it was a lot... And, Every now and again, you'd see one of these peers in a kind of ermine and red robe, and you think, oh, God, this is where I am. Um, but when the cameras, you know, switched on and that first echo of kind of music came up, which was just utterly spine-tingling, it was just, it was magical from start to finish. It really was. What were the conversations in that congregation? What, what, were, you, what were people around you saying about this incredible spectacle? Well, they're mostly wondering when they could use the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? They mocked me the other day for being concerned about that. How does one cope? Because you all had to be there for, I had, what, 7 a.m.? Yeah, I had to be at the Abbey at 7 a.m. and didn't get out till till 2, so it was pretty much nil by mouth. So, were you, so you're basically a camel. What, how, um, how do you deal with that? Yeah, there, there were toilets there, but it was the big topic of conversation when we started, is where <laughs> were they and was anyone going to get a chance to go? Because there was genuinely a cut-off point after which that was it you couldn't leave your seat so um and there was a very funny moment um when Anton Deck the kind of very popular British TV celebrities arrived and everyone clapped them when they went in and then where I was sitting happened to be fairly <laughs> near the toilets and, and they went, went to the loo and everyone kind of clapped them and sorry going sorry to the Anton Deck go to the loo together yes. I mean it doesn't surprise me yes. <laughs> <laughs> they do everything else together yeah, yeah I mean obviously everyone was you know very invested in the sem you know in the in the ceremony but it was just you know that was the funny topic of conflict, topic of conversation before it all kicked oh, off. It's something you'll never forget. Uh, do you know, I, I, Credry, I always sound very privileged to do this job, but days like today really make you feel that, to actually see, you know, a piece of history like that unfolding in front of your eyes. And it was all done so beautifully because there was a lot of conversation. We've talked all about it. Was it going to be as grand as it should have been? Would there be enough pomp and ceremony? I think there was... I think they actually played it brilliantly. There was enough of that, but enough of, you know, showing the diversity of this country, having women bishops involved. Um, they had a brilliant choir singing hallelujah that, you know, I'm sure the Abbey's, you know, never heard in the form of a coronation before. It was, it was fantastic. Oh, wow. Well, some people like Richard and myself weren't posh enough to <laughs> be in the Abbey. We had to watch it on TV, like commoners, and we'll come to the seating plan in a moment. But even on TV, Richard, the emotion of the king was palpable, wasn't it? It was so obvious. It, it really was. I mean, you know, imagine how nervous he was. He's been, you know, kind of trained for this moment all his life, really. And there it was finally happening. I suspect it will be a bit like a wedding where the days sort of pass by and he'll, he'll barely remember what happened. He did look um, rather nervous, mm. I thought. But um, I, I thought he looked like just completely overwhelmed with the meaning of it all he looked no, he, he, I mean, he really did yeah. Yeah. I, I think so yeah and um, Camilla too but it's um, I mean there, there were no hiccups were there that's what amazed me all these things like you know putting on the crowns all the difficult things they had to do and it all went seamlessly so amazing well from where I was sitting actually you say about the crowns on, on Camilla's they had to do a little bit of a wiggle and yeah. the archbishop was kind of working out where to place it and you could see her hand instinctively go up to go oh I might and she was like you could see her going no no I mustn't help I must let the Archbishop of Canterbury well, do it. Imagine if it had, yeah. you know, toppled off but, or whatever. But it's is, un but unthinkable. Does it fit? Uh, do they, or do you just have to 
that's the crown. Yeah. That it's no, been no, no, around they, for decades. No. If it doesn't fit you, tough. Well, no, I mean, they they were taken away to yeah. the, from the Tower of London to be resized. And I was told actually, um, Camilla's um, uh, head was too small for her crown, so they had to make it slightly bigger. Which I think is one of the reasons why they might have taken the arches out of the top. And mm -hmm. the king's was changed as well. But um, definitely better heavy. than the other they're, way around, isn't it? They were like six pounds. Big. You know these things. They're, they're heavy, so it, you know. The weight of that and the robes and the mantles and things like that, you know, it's for a couple in their 70s, it's, you know, quite a physically taxing thing to go through as well. I hope they're having a relaxing drink now at the palace. I, I know they're having a you know, relaxing <laughs> drink. They're, they've gone to Windsor, I think, so. Just have a bit of, bit of a lie down, I yeah. would have thought. But now, a lot of people, Rebecca, have been moved by the moment between Charles and William. What was that like to witness in the Abbey? You could tell it was a really emotional for the king, and he kind of whispered, you know, thank you, William, as he did it. Um, because they haven't always had the best relationship, Charles and William, but they've, they've really become closer together, a lot closer together in recent years. A, because they're growing up, and I think there's more of an appreciation from William of, of the job that his father's tried to do. Um, uh, obviously, everything with Harry has, you know, brought them closer, but you could see it was really emotional. And I have to say, I, I did shed a tear at one point. Um, and that was when, just before the anointing, and um, we saw the king kneel, and he had this kind of simple linen shift on, which is meant to symbolise kind of purity and simplicity. And he chose to have one that belonged to his grandfather, King George VI, instead of having one made for him. And you could you could see his bare neck, and he seemed really kind of vulnerable in that moment. And then he heard the echoes of kind of Zadok the priest ring out, and. I'm, I'm sure at home the music was incredible, but when you're in the abbey and that incredible vaulted ceiling and the acoustics, I mean, it sends it send shivers down my spine just thinking about it now. It was, it was just spectacular. Did you um, take any sneaky pictures? No, we, we really <laughs> couldn't. We weren't even allowed to live tweet. That's how serious it oh was. Oh, my so. word. Did it yeah. even happen if it wasn't tweeted live? <laughs> now, R Richard, we nearly had another fountain pen moment, didn't we? <laughs> this is quite funny. I, yeah. I thought this sort of illustrated why um, Camilla will be such a good queen for, uh, for King Charles, because when he had to sign the documents, um, you, you could see her almost sort of um, rolling her eyes. Uh, in uh, People will remember the difficulties that with fountain pens after um, becoming king. He had to sign lots of documents and sometimes they didn't work and sometimes he um, showed his irritation a bit. And so Camilla thought, oh no, not again, please. But as far as I could see, it seemed to work perfectly this time. I mean, you mentioned Camilla. That was another kind of standout moment for me is actually seeing her crowned, you know, the Archbishop holding this crown above her head mm -hmm. and then placing it down, something that, you know, people would have thought would be have been unthinkable, you know, 20, yes. 30 years ago. Yeah. And it was strange for, for me as someone who works with these people on a daily basis and, you know, you see her, you know, going about engagements, you know, talking to people, shoes that are kind of slightly scuffed around the heels a little bit sometimes, you know, when I've done an interview with her, she sits there with a, you know, a coat coming and then seeing her in this incredible Bruce Oldfield crown. And and next time she's going to be wearing that crown, so you're going to have to be more deferential. <laughs> Let's not forget, you've had um, conversations about bathroom tilings with our, <laughs> with our now sovereign. Yeah. I feel the relationship may be changing slightly. <laughs> it, was a, it was a real pinch me moment, I have yeah. to say, and certainly I know for some of the people I know who work for her who were there, they were saying very similar things. It was... Yeah, they found it quite quite moving. I thought it was very noticeable, actually. One of um, Harry and Meghan's great friends, the photographer Meeson Harriman, he posted a picture on Instagram today of Diana. Yes. I thought, hmm, that was quite quite edgy. It was a picture of, ostensibly, to celebrate Archie's birthday, which is today. And it was a still um, from the Netflix series where Archie was, I think, touching a portrait of Diana that's on their wall. Quite a strange image for a celebrated photographer like him to be, you know, posting on today a, of all day. A, a still. Yeah. So yeah, I, I suppose though the only thing is, I mean, for example, Kate was wearing some of Diana's earrings, yes. and I think. You know, there I, there was a documentary, Charles R, the big BBC documentary the other day, and they and I've thought before I watched it, oh, how are they going to cover this? Are they just going to ignore Diana? But they didn't, and they covered it in you know in quite a kind of classy, gentle touch way. So I mm. think they're not 
they're not scared of saying, look, this, this is part of his past. It's the man he makes, man he is today. It's what makes him the man he is today, those experiences. They don't try to ignore it, I don't think. But Diana's grandchildren, obviously, there. Lots of people delighted with the role of the royal children. Oh, I mean, they were just, you know, adorable. Um, and my favourite, actually, I have to say, I know everyone always loves Louis for his antics, and he was very, very cute. But I just love Charlotte. I she do, she looked incredible. She really looked yeah. angelic, I thought. And I love the idea of matching her outfit with her mother's. Mm. It was, it was, and it really, it really worked, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, normally that could look a bit twee, but because they're obviously matching Alexander McQueen outfits, but they were just so both beautifully made and so appropriate for that person. There's something about Charlotte. Obviously, she's very young, but she does seem to have a certain poise already. I yeah, think. Yeah, definitely. Very mature beyond her years. I yeah. think. Yeah, she's very. She's. She looks accustomed to being a royal. She. She's the most confident waver. Of those three kids, don't I feel you like think? she's a Princess yeah. Anne Mark II, maybe yeah. on the way. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. And she saw as you come into the Abbey. I mean, I couldn't see it from where I was sitting, but I could see it on the television screen there. Her taking her little brother's hand and you know showing yeah. him what to do. Um, and, and George as well. I mean, oh, he looks so grown up. Yeah, to to have to hold his grandfather's robe in front of you know, two and a half thousand people in the Abbey, let alone the hundreds of million that were watch, watched it around the world. That's a, a big weight on small shoulders, isn't there's it? A, there's a lovely photograph that will be in the papers um, tomorrow is of the, the pages of honour on the balcony and they're kind of having a laugh, the, the lads back together. And I'm sure that was that sort of relief of mm. having got this very well, nerve wracking job out of the way. On, on, wrong. on that balcony, we saw Camilla's grandchildren, mm. which again is another piece of history now that would have been just not thinkable. And if you look at the footage, she was really at pains as she walked through it. She was ushering the children, come on, come on to the front to, you know, to be mm. with to be with Gaga, which is what they call her. Um, and she was very clear she wanted them, you know, front and centre because they are a big blended family. I, mean, I remember her telling me in an interview a couple of years ago, you know, they, they, they love Charles as a grandfather. You know, he used to to read them stories in bed, tell them the Harry Potter stories, do all the funny voices. You know, they absolutely adore him. Mm. And you see them go into Clarence House now, they're older, and, you know, I've been to receptions where they've walked in, and you, you just see them dropping a kiss casually on his cheek and then go around. You know, they are, they are a blended modern family now. Mm. Oh, well, let's move on now, because we love reading your comments, as you know, and over the last couple of shows they've been amazing. Here are a couple of our favourites from yesterday's. If you missed that special episode, make sure you check it out. Barb Edwards had this to say after our discussion of Charles. I think a lot of us forget that the crown, in quotes, is more than just the king. It is all his advisers, the machination of the palace officials who all believe they know what is best for the king, the people and the situation. In many ways, as well as the glorious monarch, when life is smooth sailing, the king ends up being the punching bag when things go wrong. OK, well, thank you for that. And commenting on the chat I had with Sarah Vine about Camilla's role, Wendy King wrote, Queen Camilla, like many wives or husbands of public people, knows how to ease the stress in the moment when something goes amiss. And we saw that today, didn't we? It's a beautiful thing about well-functioning long-term couples. Lots of you got in touch to say that you agreed with what Tom Bauer had to say about cutting off the Sussexes after the coronation. This is from Anna Paula Canadas. I agree with Tom Bauer. After the coronation, something will have to be done. A king's first duty is to listen to his people. Too many olive branches have already been offered without any goodwill on the part of those who have received them. Now is the time to act, not to negotiate. Strong words there. But on that note, you have to wonder how Harry will be feeling after Princess Anne's ornate red hat feather covered his face for the TV cameras. <laughs> Richard, coincidence or conspiracy? What, what's going on I here? Think I don't know what Richard's <laughs> going to say on this one. I don't know. I mean, our, our viewers might remember at Queen Elizabeth's funeral where there were two very large candles that just happened to obscure the um, television viewers' view of Meghan and Harry. And then this time, Prince Harry just happened to be seated behind Prince 
Princess Anne, who they would have known was going to wear the most enormous hat. <laughs> and then um, to, to top this um, uh, military hat she was wearing, um, she chose a, a very large feather, a very big plume, and that plume pretty much obscured Harry but completely. It, forgive my ignorance, is, is, is it a choice, that feather, or is it, is it part of the <laughs> I think it's the, it's re the regalia, it, the it's tradition? Part the, it's, it's part, part of the uniform, uniform but of yeah. course yeah. someone decides where everybody sits. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Now, Rebecca, all this after your story that Harry was obsessed by the seating plan prior to the event. Yeah, I mean, may, maybe it came as a blessed relief to him that, you know, the cameras weren't focusing on what his expression was and who he was speaking to. I mean, I thought his arrival was a bit awkward, I have to say. You know, he kind of was with Beatrice and Eugenie. And they, and they were chatting with him and chatting with Jack Brooksbank. But as they walked down the, the nave into the main part of the abbey, they were seated in the kind of the South Lantern. Obviously, all the couples were walking together and obviously he was standing there as a kind of single man on his own walking in and he I noticed that he saw a couple of people to left to right and kind of said hello but it it, it, it was pretty awkward I thought. What do you think about what do you make of this online chatter that some people saying he didn't seem to sing the national anthem with much gusto. Uh, th th this is quite funny. It was yeah. that um, he could be seen sort of visibly looking down at his um, yeah. hymn sheet when it came to the second verse. And it's really interesting, actually, because in um, Harry's memoirs, he talks um, about how he almost sort of prided himself on his ignorance of lots of aspects of British history. And he was he was kind of bullied, he said, by a history teacher who expected him to know the kings and queens of this country, as you, as you might think. He sort mm. of mocked him in front of his classmates saying, oh, that's your family, you should know. Um, and he, he sort of makes the point, I didn't want to know. And it's almost like that. He didn't want to know the second verse of the, <laughs> the national anthem, you know. But let, let's not I'm underestimate. I'm sure I know the second verse, no. but I'm Australian, that's my excuse. <laughs> let's yeah. not underestimate the significance of the seating plan, though. I mean, my goodness, you know, you've got Camilla's children on the um, front row, the front pew at, at the Abbey. And then you've got the king's, you know, younger son on the third row. Um, you know, it's, it really is um, significant. Well, then, that I don't understand then, because yes, Camilla's children are front and centre because they are our new Queen's children. And Harry's third row because he's a non working royal, but he is also the King's son. So, how, how, where does that logic. Look, let, let's be clear if there was no Oprah interview, there was no Netflix series, there was no tawdry memoir, I bet you Harry would have been back on the front row. I really do. But he's done so much to antagonise people that I, I think that that's deliberate. I mean, I'd be interested to hear, hear what well, you think. Well, obviously, when you talk about compare with the grand, Camilla's grandchildren family, they were on different sides of um, yeah. the. Um, uh, the what's called the Coronation Theatre. So they were on the north uh, transept and the royals were on the south transept. And then you go working royals at the front, going back to non-working royals. But it does, every time you see him in that position, it is a visible reminder of how much life has changed over the last few years. As you rightly say, Richard, he would have been on the front row for something like that. I and, mean, no doubt about it. And was, did anybody clock any interaction, even a quick nod between Harry and William? Do no. we know? No. I didn't. I mean, I thought it was very significant that he entered with um, Eugenie and Beatrice, who, let's be honest, they're pretty much the only royals who still stay in um, close mm. contact with him, I think. But, I mean, let's, you know, let's not forget Meghan's absence from this. I mean, my goodness, you know, the great showbiz journalist um, tweeted to Baz Bamingboy, he said, oh, this is the greatest show on earth. And then you've got, you know, the former actress, she would always want to be centre stage, and she just wasn't there at all. I yeah. think for her, it's a huge loss. It really is. Uh, Prince uh, Prince Andrew, also pretty hard to see in that mm. abbey. I mean, yeah, again, he was relegated to the, to the non-working royals, but I thought it was interesting that he either insisted or was allowed to wear his Order of the Garter robes. Um, when actually all the other non-working royals, like Harry, for example, he just had his medals and his KCVO around his neck, which he's Andrew allowed to wear. Andrew loves a fancy dress, doesn't he? Yeah. He wanted to wear his sort of naval uniform. But some and of truthfully, it, yeah. I don't know whether that's because the king decided to, to let him do that or he asked to do that, but I thought it looked a bit incongruous, to be honest. I think mm. you either 
a working role and you wear that stuff or you're not and you don't and but he is entitled to, to wear it if he wants to now rebecca wasn't the only one out and about today our very own king of palace confidential richard eden went to meet his public his fans <laughs> sorry fans of the royal family out in central london this morning hello i'm richard eden and I'm in Whitehall where the procession will be passing in a few hours' time. There's great excitement here. Crowds are gathering. It's starting to get thicker and thicker. So where have you come from today? Stafford in the Midlands. Uh, did you have to leave very early? We actually came yesterday because when we came for the Jubilee, we arrived with our suitcases and it was a disaster. Having said that, we got on the Mall, we saw the fly past, we saw the beautiful 70 from the RAF, so we did have a lovely day. Yeah, so and this year we've come, we've come prepared. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And um, do you watch Palace Confidential? All the time. I have it on subscribe on my YouTube channels. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. She sent it to me. Yeah, and I watch it as well. Oh, yeah. that's it's fab. Good, yeah. Really enjoy it. Excellent. Yeah. And who's and your you favourite? You are, of course. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and is this your first big royal occasion? Yes, it yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. Well, you look amazing, dressed Thank up. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> and who you look forward to seeing? Well, I'm not sure where we'll get a big view from here, because it's not coming down this end, is it? It's uh -huh. no, going down. Going just Hopefully, down. I'll tiptoe and see something. Well, it will be here in Whitehall in yeah. front of us. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Hi, and where have you come from today? And we've travelled um, from Leicester today on the train, yeah. so we got up really early. Um, what time did you have to get up? Um, about quarter to four. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so very early, yes. Very good. And what are you looking forward to seeing today? Um, I'm looking forward to see um, the coach, um, the king and the queen and the procession, um, just everything really. So just really, um, really loving the atmosphere. And it was really good atmosphere on the train coming down because everyone had got flags and we were all sharing stories. There was a lady on the train who'd got two flags from the 1930s that had been handed down by her grandfather. So yeah, it was really nice atmosphere. Yeah. And are you disappointed there'll be no Harry and Meghan here? Um, it is a shame. It would have been nice if they could have come, yes, definitely. But yeah. Harry's coming, so I think that's the main thing. He's there for his father. Well, I love your hat. Thank that's great. You, yeah. And you've got your poster ready. Yeah, I've got my, I've got my poster. I've got my, I love my child's poster. <laughs> got my flag. How long have you been here? Uh, we've been here since about half six this morning. We got the train at half five. What would you do if you were queen for a day? Oh, I'd ride in the carriage and wear all my jewels. <laughs> Get all the horses out and the, have all the uh, army men follow me around. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank right. you. Oh, Richard, you're our favourite. What are we doing wrong, Rebecca? What are we doing wrong? <laughs> well, we're certainly asking the wrong <laughs> question. No, That's very Rebecca would, have been, Rebecca would have been too if she'd um, been there, I'm sure. <sighs> Poor old Elvin, just stuck in the studio. But <laughs> you look like you're having fun. Um, no, it was it was really great, actually. We didn't um, make it to the Mall. We were actually on, on Whitehall, which was another part of the procession route but there was there was a really lovely atmosphere and there were people that had come from you know from Australia there was a couple of um, ladies of quite a great age that had come from Melbourne we met ladies from Thailand there were all sorts of people and it was great to bump into quite a few Palace Confidential absolutely viewers. what I mean who would have thought when we started this show it's amazing isn't it yeah. you sure the yeah. producer didn't stick them there Richard <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so it, it, honestly it was you know p people have often said oh Prince Charles is um, he's never going to be as popular as his mother and all of this sort of thing. But, you know, what really struck me was, um, you know, the popularity, the enthusiasm um, and just the sense of goodwill, really, wanting him to be a success and just a general kind of good atmosphere towards him. Yeah. That's what it, came across. It's interesting you talk about the international flavour of it because obviously earlier this week, um, the day before the coronation, uh, William and Kate went to the Dog and Duck pub in Soho to thank the people who were working over the bank holiday weekend. And I was speaking today with someone who works with them and apparently William remarked afterwards they did a walkabout in the crowd and he said he couldn't believe how international the people that come see them well you know he said there was people from this country this country this country and it really blew him away how mm. how many people had traveled over to um to kind of take part and to soak up the coronation atmosphere and he was really touched by yeah, it yeah i'm sure the royal family will be generally by that sense of goodwill yeah it's amazing mm. um now a word on one of my favorite subjects now rebecca what were your fashion highlights from the ceremony well, I've mentioned Princess Charlotte because I yeah. just, that for me was just the standout. I mean, obviously, Princess of Wales looked incredible. And actually, I did particularly love 
what she was wearing in her hair because I know there was a bit of disappointment about no tiaras. Oh, I thought but they it, were spectacular. I thought it, I thought it was wonderful, and I thought it kind of looked like a tiara as well, but not. I still don't understand why they were told not to. I don't really see the logic. No, I want that. to say because we were here. Did, but I still think it looked beautiful. Yeah. Did you like it? Because I know you were very down on any kind of idea of a floral. Um, so I mean, obviously Catherine looks absolutely fantastic. But when we were here on Thursday with Sarah Vine, we couldn't quite believe this story in the mm. Times that people, that the women, wouldn't be wearing tiaras, and that. To me, that is a disappointment from if, this If Richard had had pearls on that day, they would have been clutched, <laughs> you know, me. Yeah, I mean, I, I just thought that I don't understand why. You know, they've got these amazing tiaras that the royal family have access to. And, you know, women like Sophie, um, her daughter, you know, Princess Eugenie, they all should have been wearing great tiaras. And then the European royals, who we were lucky to see today, because of the British royals not wearing them, they didn't either. So they were all, most of them were dressed as if for a wedding. Um, so I, I thought, to me, that was a disappointment. I mean, I think it might be that the king sort of didn't want such an ost ostentatious kind of show of all these jewels. Yeah. He just, he's yeah. very much aware that, you know, there's... a a lot of people um, hard up at the moment struggling. So I think he was very apprehensive about having this spectacular display of we're so rich, we're so lucky sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, you're spot on actually with that because I had a, in my story in um, today's Daily Mail, I had a quote from a, you know, a senior palace source that said to me that um, they wanted to ensure that the coronation had the right amount of pomp and majesty but it, it, it was less about the difference between them and them and us. So it was trying to strike that balance, and maybe that's one of the one of the things they wanted to lose was mm. tiaras. But then they were wearing priceless, you know, family heirlooms in terms of jewels, and you've got the you know the crown jewels, the orbs, the scepters, the diamonds. So it wasn't like uh, they were short of bling. That <laughs> sword was damn bling. I mean, how <laughs> oh, much is that? Got what? to be priceless. Actually, if you want yeah. another, if you're talking about fashion highlight, highlights, Penny Morden to me. Oh yeah. Penny Morden to me was um, the kind of coronation equivalent of Pippa Middleton's bottom at the William and Kate. I think, well, I think you should explain yeah, who yeah. she is to our viewers. Uh, she, she's a politician, and she was carrying the kind of you know one of the very bejeweled swords, which are very he heavy. I saw an interview with her this afternoon that she said she'd been doing press ups. I was going to say Quite she went to the gym for, for a week because now. It, because she was had to hold it like this yeah. the whole time. It was and really incredibly steady. helpful. I mean, she, heavy. Her um, role seemed so important, didn't it? Almost like a sort of master of ceremonies because she's the Lord President of the Privy and Council, the first mm. woman to have that role. Mm. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and and she really did seem significant. And I loved her outfit. Apparently, the, co the color apparently was something to do because she comes from a, a naval area, and it mm. was something to do with that. And she just looked magnificent. It, I thought it looked almost like something from the Game of Thrones set. It could have almost passed as a costume there, but I mean that in a good way. I absolutely loved it. I've never watched Game of Thrones. Oh, well, there you go. Well, if well, well, but she yeah. looked great. Yeah. What I would say is that I hope that we haven't now got to the point, though, where they can't get these jewels out again. You know, next mm. time we see a state banquet and there's a state visit from a head of state, I hope that for, you know, they'll get the tiaras out. It would be terrible if they kind of consign this to history. I know what, your, I know your what you Majesty, mean. Your yeah. Majesty, Richard Eden wants you to get your jewels out next time, so make sure, <laughs> make sure you do. You're right. I mean, they shouldn't be ashamed of them they they do have them i yeah. mean it, it reminds me years ago when we were talking about travel and there was a lot of criticism of prince of wales getting private jets and things like that and i remember you know a senior royal staff are saying to me the thing is rebecca if you're going to if we're going to have a monarchy and i know there's lots of debate about whether we should and that's valid debate but if we do have one you've got to accept that they're not necessarily like us and yeah. would we want them to be like us because Otherwise, then, then they're not really that special. You know, as a head of state, there has always got to be something a bit different about them. And we were we were talking about that in in kind of reference to whether they should travel on easy jet or whether they should travel on a, you know, a private jet or a government plane. But I think the same applies to the jewels and stuff. You know, if we've got a royal family, we accept they will have. You know, your earrings, Joe, very beautiful. They're from Accessorize, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Rebecca, for outing me there. Yeah, they're, but, they're not family saying, heirlooms, I funnily enough. I love them, yeah. but you wouldn't expect yeah. at the at the coronation the Princess of Wales to be to be looking at our Accessorize earrings. You've just got to accept oh, that. They've got something bigger and better some great than us. I, I, sh I should say here that the company that provided the suit for Prince Harry you know, rather tackily sort of did a post um, boasting about it on social media. Oh, dear, yeah. So, um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, very rapidly as well, anyway. Yeah. Well, on a day of 
really extraordinary images. It's hard to narrow them down, but we've done our best. And here's a montage of some of the most memorable moments from an historic day. Well, some of those images will live long in the memory, I'm sure. And I hope you've enjoyed our three special episodes. Thank you so much for watching. And my thanks as always to Rebecca and Richard. We'll be back with Palace Confidential on Thursday. See you then.